Hello, welcome to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I am the Curator of Astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition of the program, we cover the dates of February 14th through February 20th. We're going to start by talking about Valentine's Day and look at a couple Valentine's-themed objects in our night sky that are currently up at this time of the year. Then we'll fast forward to the middle of the week where we'll see a nice full moon. And then we'll move to the early morning sky where we can see Mercury reach its highest position above the sun along with a couple other planets that are nice in that area of the sky. So let's get to it. On Monday, February 14th, we have the lovely holiday of Valentine's Day. And maybe you'll be spending some time with some loved ones, maybe exploring the night sky on that evening. And an annual tradition of ours is to explore some of the Valentine's themed objects that you could possibly find in the sky or at least are up in the sky. And these are things you're not going to see with your naked eyes. And it's fun to know that these objects are there and it ties into symbols and stories of love found throughout history. And one of the first objects we can talk about is something you definitely cannot see with your naked eyes. It's too small, it's too dim, at about two and a half AU from us, two and a half times the Earth's sun distance. And that is an asteroid called 433 Eros. And we can actually find that in our evening sky. We can use Stellarium to pinpoint where it is. So if you're out on Valentine's Day, technically you can see it just above the west near the setting sun here and not for too long. And you can see it's just above where Jupiter is still lingering in the sky. And again, this is something you cannot see with your naked eyes, but it's technically there. And the name Eros ties perfectly in with Valentine's because it's named after the Greek god of love. You probably know the Roman name because it's called Cupid. You know that small child with wings flying around with a bow and arrow shooting these love arrows into folks and making them fall in love? That's based off of Cupid. Well, the Greek equivalent is Eros. Eros was the love child of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, or Venus, and Ares, the god of war, or Mars. So this is the offspring of those two very important gods, especially the god of love, Aphrodite. So Eros has that connection with Valentine's. And this is what's known as a near-Earth asteroid, an asteroid that comes in between the orbit of Mars and Earth, a very tight orbit, and it goes around the sun every 1.67 years. And this is something you need a very large telescope to see, or a radio telescope was one of the first objects mapped by the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, and it was one of the first asteroids to be visited and studied by a spacecraft, which occurred in the late 90s and early 2000s with the near Shoemaker spacecraft. And this spacecraft actually flew by Eros in 1998, and then in 2000 entered into orbit around this asteroid, going around it over 200 times, studying it from orbit, and taking numerous pictures of the surface, helping us understand near-Earth objects, which is really, really important because these are the kind of objects that get very close to us. Many of these objects can cross or orbit, so you have to look out for things like that. And understanding these objects help us to better understand the very inner parts of our solar system and the evolution of the objects in that area. And going back to that near spacecraft, after its numerous orbits in 2000, actually made the first asteroid soft landing in 2001, so that was a pretty big deal. But there's one more connection with Valentine's I love when it comes to this asteroid. And in one of the orbits, as this spacecraft went around Eros, it took a picture of one side of the asteroid and noticed this small crater on it. And what's kind of neat, from a certain angle, the crater looks like a heart. So you have a heart-shaped crater on an asteroid named after the god of love, Eros, or Cupid to the Romans. So there's a lot of Valentine's connections here. And again, something you can't see with your naked eyes, but it's nice to know that you find it just above the west, and programs like Stellarium can at least point you in the right direction of where it technically is in our sky. Now, continuing on this heart theme, if you're out a little bit later into the evening, once it's actually dark out on the 14th, and we're looking around those great wintertime constellations that we've been talking about quite a bit lately, like Orion the Hunter that we find right here in the sky. There's Orion's belt there, the brightest star Sirius, the Gemini twins right here. But embedded inside this area is actually a dim constellation that is relatively unknown, or at least not talked about quite often. And that is a constellation in here called Monoceros, which is the unicorn constellation. If you didn't know, there's a unicorn 
in our night sky somehow that's formed in this area here by some dim stars. So I'll draw it for you to show you the outline of this. And there we have Venoceros the unicorn. So I'm showing you this because this next object here is near the head of the unicorn and it's quite famous, at least when it comes to deep sky objects. So we're gonna look for this by searching for what's called the Rosette Nebula. We're gonna connect right to it, so you can see near the head of Monoceros, not too far from Orion the Hunter, that's Betelgeuse, the star there. You have an object right about here. So we're gonna zoom into this, and it is an absolutely beautiful nebula. Let's turn off the picture here so it's not blocking our view of the Rosette Nebula. And it really does look like a rose in the sky. You can almost see the petal-like structures here of a rose, which of course is the signature flower you give out in Valentine's. And so there happens to be a nebula in the shape of this beautiful flower, or at least has the appearance of it. And since this is a nebula, it's a big cloud of gas and dust, a little over 5,000 light years away. And there's a lot of interesting things going on inside of this. This is a very famous star forming region and what's also called an H2 region. That means that the hydrogen gas that you see mostly here, that's what you see in all this kind of pinkish reddish color, that hydrogen gas is being ionized, which means that it's lighting up by the interaction from the light and energy from the stars within it that you see right in here. Because stars are born in big clumps of gas and dust that clump together, and as mass is added up, a star is born. And so you get these really hot, really luminous stars in the middle here, and they shine very brilliantly, especially in ultraviolet light, and that interacts with the gas around it, ionizes the gas, and allows that gas to light up and be seen. And in pictures like this, this is not something you would see with your naked eyes through a telescope. This takes some astrophotography, some long exposure photography. And there's a lot of great photos you can find online. Of course, there's larger observatories around the world that have captured this in various ways, showing us the details here. And you can really get a good view of the interaction between new stars and the gas that formed them some time ago. And what you find if we look a little bit more closely in the Rosette Nebula here, are these pockets of gas, and this is where you'll find the gas crunching up, or at least piling up, and possibly forming new stars. So you get kind of a runaway effect of star birth when you have new stars born, that can set off even more stellar birth around it as the gas is being pushed away and clumping into new stars. You see these kind of dense little knots here, those dense knots, could be places where new stars form. So those are places resisting some of the stellar wind from these stars embedded inside of here. And the stellar wind and the pushing and pressure from the light can create sort of this layered kind of effect, sort of the petal-like effect of the sort of rose that you're looking kind of in the middle of or right down the center. So I love that for Valentine's, the Rosette Nebula inside Monoceros, the unicorn, within that winter area of our night sky. And then from here, we're gonna move over to the north and northwest to some late fall constellations that are still in the sky. And this also relates to Valentine's as well. So we're making our way over to the well-known shape of this W, which you may know is Cassiopeia the Queen, right? And so within Cassiopeia, there are two nebula that are fairly near each other that tie into this love-themed holiday. So we're gonna search for that here. And what we're going to locate is something called the Heart Nebula. So that's just straight to the point. A nebula that seems to be in the shape of a heart, which works really well. As we get closer to it, you can kind of see it really is sort of a misshapen heart, but you kind of get the idea. It is a very human thing to assign shapes that we recognize in our society to celestial objects, and you can kind of see that here. There is the heart shape that you can find that I was mentioning. It kind of goes like this and kind of like that as well. So this nebula is also commonly known as IC1805, and it's very similar to the Rosette Nebula. It's a little farther away at about 7,500 light years away, but it's another H2 region of ionized gas from the stars embedded inside. So we have stars in here that were born out of this gas and dust. Some of them are very massive, much larger than our sun, that shine brilliantly in ultraviolet ionizing or lighting up the gas inside of it. It's also creating this kind of cavern inside the heart. So we're kind of creating sort of the, the chambers of the heart, if you will, from the stars inside that create these kind of shapes you see here. And on the edge, you'll see some of the denser gas, maybe resisting some of the stellar wind, 
And again, you get that stellar birth runaway effect of new stars that kind of line the outer portions of the heart that we find there. So that's a great nebula, really looks kind of like a heart in the sky. And what's also great about this area is not too far away. If you're an astrophotographer, you've probably also pointed to something that's just above it, at least from this point of view. And that is something called the Sol Nebula right here. Now in this picture, you don't see it as well, but there's kind of another heart in this area. And I'll just sort of trace it out in here. You'll find that kind of heart shape here. But again, this one's called the Sol Nebula. And you have pictures like this that kind of give you a better view of the heart. This is an infrared picture that's quite famous from NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope that's no longer in service, but it gave us some great images of this. And again, another H2 region, another area of star birth where those stars are lighting up the gas around it. So there seems to be a connection between stars kind of carving out material and shaping material into the shapes that we relate to with Valentine. And the Sol Nebula really kind of stays in line with that theme. It's a really beautiful one. Through those pictures, if you're an astrophotographer, it's another great target for folks. Not too far away from the Heart Nebula here inside of Cassiopeia that you still find in the northwestern part of the sky. So those are some great examples of connections to Valentine's. Again, a very human thing to do to kind of tie in the shapes that we connect with hearts and love and roses and things of that nature to the beautiful objects in our night sky. It's always worth making that connection. This Wednesday, February 16th, we have a full moon for the month of February. And for the full moon in February, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, this is what we call the snow moon. And it makes quite a lot of sense, at least in this part of the world, this is the winter time and typically a time of year. If you're in a snowier area where there's a lot more snowfall, you might have snow on the ground. And of course you find colder temperatures at this time of the year. So a snow moon makes quite a lot of sense. But to Native American tribes, there's been other names that associate with this moon. Sometimes the raccoon moon, the bear moon, the Groundhog Moon, that kind of ties in with Groundhog's Day, which said six more weeks of winter when that occurred. And the one that also makes a lot of sense, another Native American name, which is the Hunger Moon, because typically at this time of year, hunting was quite difficult because of the temperatures, because of the snowy environment, making folks a little bit more hungry because of that scarcity of food. But typically we call it the Snow Moon. And here in Florida, of course, we don't get any snow, but if you are in a snowier environment, this may be a great time to be outside in the evening. If it's clear, you can brave some of that colder weather. And if you're out in a snow environment, maybe in the mountains or something, to see that large full moon shine over the landscape, lighting up and reflecting off the snow and the trees and all of that can be a wonderful sight to see. So you can take advantage of using that large moon, even though it obscures some of the dimmer objects in the night sky, to appreciate the landscape around you and appreciate what the winter has to offer here in the Northern Hemisphere. So maybe you get a chance to appreciate the full moon that way on the 16th this week. Shifting to the early morning sky just before sunrise, this is when at the middle of the week we see Mercury at its highest above the sun and about highest in our sky. So we find Mercury right here just above the rising sun and this is about the morning of the 15th or morning of the 16th. Around there is when Mercury is at what's called greatest elongation west, so that Mercury is most west of the sun, which means it's about highest in our morning sky that we can find it. And what you've probably noticed as you've been watching these videos is we talk about greatest elongation east and west for Mercury quite a bit because it moves so quickly, faster than any other planet in the solar system, it only takes about 88 days to go around the sun one time in its orbit. So since it moves so quickly, it moves from each extreme very often throughout the year. But what's great about the morning right now is that Mercury is joining a couple more planets. So you have a little bit better view of the smallest planet in the solar system. And then just above Mercury, you'll find Venus shining brilliantly. We just saw Venus at its brightest and still very bright right now and now starting to dim ever so slowly, but still a great object to see here. And then we have Mars down here as well. That's definitely not as bright as Venus, but it will be there and Mars and Venus are getting closer and closer. And just going back to that Valentine's theme, and we can't forget that Venus is the Roman name of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, the goddess 
of love. So of course, we have to mention that when it comes to Valentine's, the goddess of love, this planet, our sister planet, as we sometimes call it, is in the sky in the morning right now if you haven't had a chance to see it. So nice to have Venus, Mars, and again, especially Mercury reaching its highest position in our morning sky. That's usually very fleeting. You don't have much time to see it before it again descends back into the sun and the cycle continues going to greatest elongation east later in this season. Thank you for tuning in for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. And if you're in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences where you can see so many great exhibits on display. And while you're here, check out the Loman Planetarium for a show. We're running them daily and we have so many great programs on our schedule. So if you want any more information about what's going on, check out our website. With that, we hope to see you back here again. I want to say happy Valentine's Day this week, and of course, happy stargazing.